welcome. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Scott McCarty, who's going to tell us everything we need to know about how a container engine works. As soon as he finishes his slides. <laughs> <laughs> I added one small thing. <laughs> All right. We'll leave it up there. You guys can't see that yet. All right. Let's 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 see if it updated. Nope. You know what we got to do? We got to make sure that... Yep, it did. Nice. The cloud. All right. How are you guys? All right. Um, all right. Uh, before I start, I want to kind of gauge the audience. So how many of you have used Docker? The command line. Good. All right. How many of you are familiar with OCI standards? Decent amount. All right. Um, how many of you are programmers? All right. That's good. All right. So we have a pretty good technical audience. All right. This will be good. Um, I just want to kind of understand where people are at so I know how kind of deep and how, f and how quickly I can speak because I have a tendency to start speaking very quickly when I get excited. Um, so... I'm going to jump in because we have till what time do we have till? I'm good at winging this stuff, right? 35 minutes. 35 minutes. All right. So we have 35 minutes. We're going to rock and or roll. Um, all right. So I designed this talk around some premises that are typically wrong, right? So, so I hear people say this all the time, like, you know, well, I just run Docker so I can just run my containers. And then you will see, like, all these architectural drawings on the Internet that basically shows, like, containers just running on the blue line. You'll see, like, a blue line smeared across the top of, like, container hosts, one or multiple. And then you'll just see, you know, containers on. It's wrong. So just start from scratch. It's not right. And then sometimes you'll see another drawing. Um, I didn't put it on here, but if you look at this one. This is an example of a Google search where there's a bunch of wrong ones that way. The other one you'll see is you'll you'll see just um, you know just a bunch of containers running on the host with nothing else, and that's kind of like 1980s containers is what I call those. That that also doesn't tell the whole story. So I'm going to try to like explain it from the ground up and actually explain how it actually works. <laughs> So that one, you'll understand it better, and two, you'll be able to make better architectural decisions. So, because I've answered so many crazy questions that I start to understand where people's black boxes are. And, and oh, let me point out one other thing. Since you're all programmers, and many of you are, abstraction is good, right? It makes our life more convenient, but still understanding what that abstraction does is important for architectural choices and making the right choice. So that's why I think this is important. So, um, start with... Processes versus containers. What is the difference? How many of you feel like you could write this on the back of a napkin right now? Raise your hand. <laughs> Not that many. All right. Dan could. I know Dan could. Nalen could. I know. Um, uh, I'd probably Thomas could. But a few people could, but not everyone. And um, the reason why is because there's really no difference in a lot of ways. I mean, so so in this drawing, I try to show, like, there's one, there's one structure in the kernel that tracks processes, and it's process ID table. And every time you add a process, the ID, you know, gets incremented, and another entry gets added. That's it. There's nothing else in the kernel. There's no other concept of, like, there's no flag in that process ID table that says this is a container or this is not a container. There's no, that doesn't exist. It's just another process as far as the kernel is concerned. Now, there are other pieces of technology that get turned on in the kernel whenever we create what's humanly called a container, but container is a human slash user space, which I'll dig into concept, that is defined at the human user space level, not in the kernel per se. Which, And I'll show you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through certain operations and then show you which pieces of technology get turned on in the kernel. So hopefully you'll be able to walk away with, from this with like a very good understanding of what a container engine does. Um, but I, and, and here I, I, I try to like boil this down. You know, container engines are really one technical implementation, which both provides a methodology for how to create containers. So like if you think about the Docker run command, that's a methodology for how you go and create a container. But it also implicit in running that command is the definition of what can you know what technologies in the kernel will get turned on when that container is ran. And so it's really you're kind of you're kind of accepting two things at the same time. So just I'll dig in deeper. Maybe it'll make more sense. Hopefully. 
So, you know, this concept of a container engine um, is new. That's like 2000, what, four or 13 ish, you know, concept. So it, it didn't really exist. If you look before, there were libraries to create containers, but it wasn't really the concept of an engine. And so, like, I like to refer to Docker as like the biggest proof of concept ever invented. It's a really good proof of concept and it's interesting. And it was probably the only way to sell us on actually using this whole thing was to kind of see it all working together. You had to see all the container images sitting in a registry, see that you could pull them down and run them with one command, um, kind of understand how to interact with a container engine, which then goes and pulls those images. But you were buying into a lot of stuff all in one big, like, you know, proof of concept, essentially. And if you think about it, you were kind of in a, a walled garden where you're like, okay, now I see how this all can work because I was, I was, I was essentially demoed it in a nutshell. Like, uh, I was given an API, a command line, registry servers, pre-built images, all of these things as a proof of concept that all work together. But today, we need to break them down into separate pieces to do a lot of other stuff. Uh, like an example is, uh, a perfect example is a couple days ago, I was working with a customer on a Hadoop thing where they were trying to use a container executor uh, with Yarn as the scheduler. That's a scenario where you don't really want all the complexity of the, as I call it, the Docker proof of concept, where you don't want client server interactions happening to a daemon to then go fire off, you know, talk to some other daemon to then talk to, to basically fire off processes and I'll get into that. But, but in a nutshell, I'm going to break this all down so that we can see all the moving pieces inside of this giant proof of concept. Um, and then I'm going to explain that drawing on the right, but I'm not going to explain it right now because it'll be too much for you. And then the other thing is, is there are other alternatives. And this was the slide that I was working on because I realized I left it out of my story. Don't ask me how. Um, you know, everybody's used Docker, but there are alternatives, right? Like Cryo is a, is a container engine that is used for inside of Kubernetes. And then Podman is a great container engine that is used outside of Kubernetes for firing up single node, you know, containers and pods. And so think of pods as multiple containers living in the same namespace. Um, on the same network, accessing the same storage, that kind of thing. Um, but like, I'll dig into kind of how, I, but this talk is actually going to dig into generally how all container engines work, what they all do, what they have in common, and like essentially kind of understanding the nuts and bolts of what's going on underneath. So another concept that I want to kind of tackle first, uh, an assumption is, um, you know, thinking about the container engine versus the container host. If you really think about it, the container host is the container engine because there's all these things that you need to think about. And when you think about it, especially in the context of Kubernetes, I think about the container host as the thing, not the container engine. I don't really want to swap out the container engine because it's literally like changing an engine once the car's been shipped. It's there's a there's a lot of engineering that goes into putting that together like you don't swap a Ford engine into a you know Chevy car after it's been shipped like that doesn't make sense um, and and I'll, I'll dig in a little bit why and the last slide in particular kind of highlights where it goes beyond just the container engine and into the kubelet and things like that and pieces in the kubelet actually talk to the kernel and so there's actually a wider ecosystem of software that's talking to the kernel not just the container engine so that's the, the one last assumption I want to tackle and then a short commercial break, and I will also include Urvashi's talk in this, but although I didn't look up when it is, but like there's another talk that goes deeper into Podman Tomorrow by Urvashi and someone else. Dan, who else is it? Nalen? I don't know who. Stallion. Sally O'Malley. So, like, check that out if you want to dig deeper into the specifics of Podman as another container engine. Um, and then tomorrow, I will be digging into the container standards um, around, uh, you know, essentially what makes all this work and why we can have three different container engines and they and they're and they're not guaranteed to work because nothing in technology is guaranteed to work. But the reasons why why this will work. Um, so, long story short, I won't dig deeply into that because it's too much to cover in one talk. But um, but I wanted to at least kind of do a commercial. Oh, yeah, and by the way, my Twitter handle, I'll shamelessly plug myself, is at the bottom of every slide, so you're, you're welcome to follow me. Um, all right, that was a bad joke, sorry. Uh, so, all right, so what, this is the main drawing that we're going to tackle. So we're going to look um, you know, at all these different components within, and we're going to kind of walk through. This is what most people that raise their hand, actually, let me ask another one. How many of you used Podman? How many have used Cryo? 
All right, so, so this is good. So I start here because I think most people have used Docker and they kind of understand. Even though so a lot of people have used Docker, though, they don't necessarily always understand what's happening under the covers. And so I kind of show here, you know, it's not just Docker, right? It's container D. Docker D talks to container D, talks to run C, which then talks to the kernel to fire up containers. And at some point, all of these technologies get turned on in the kernel. Um, and so if you really think about it, it's the kernel, run C, Docker, kubelet, you know, this whole stack. So if there's some feature that you turn on when you're like scheduling something in Kubernetes, say it's like a privileged container. Privileged container, you know, if you're telling the security context to run on, you know, privileged, you essentially, you think about it, that has to be supported from the master API in Kubernetes to the kubelet, from the kubelet to the engine, from the engine to run C, and then run C to the, you know, to the kernel. And whenever you make changes to, to an API and you add a new command line flag, for example, it has to be supported all the way down that stack. And so really, we like to think about the whole host as the container engine, because if any one of these doesn't support something, it, it pretty much doesn't work. And then here's a simplified drawing, a joke. So here's cryo. So I, I, I asked if anybody had used cryo. Well, you wouldn't really notice it in the bigger context of things, probably in like a Kubernetes environment, because it just gets rid of a box. So we get rid of that box. So we get rid of container D and Docker, and we merge them into a single container engine that understands uh, a protocol called CRI so that the kubelet can talk to the, the cryo daemon, and then the cryo daemon calls run C, which then talks to the kernel, and, and then you go on. But it's simplified stack a bit. Um, so if you haven't checked it out and you're running Kubernetes, how many of you are running Kubernetes? So not that many yet. All right, so that's good. Well, yeah, those people that raise their hand, go check out Cryo. Um, all right, so I tackle this because I think it's been lost in the ages. I, how many of you understand the difference between user space and kernel space? A decent amount. All right, that's good. <laughs> this makes me feel good about life. Um, a lot of the times, I, I, I've, had, I've done this in a crowd and like one person raises their hand. I had one time, there was like 300 people at a startup conference and like one dude raised his hand. And, and I was like, what do you do? And he's like, I teach operating systems. I was like, oh. I was like, I was like all right, we're done here. And so I, then I was whiteboarding stuff on the wall, showing people stuff. All right, but in a nutshell, the piece is, we're going to tackle like kind of the container engine lives in user space, right? And anything that it does, it needs to call into the kernel to make that happen. So in a nutshell, think of a system call as a special function that the kernel handles as opposed to other user space code that you wrote yourself handling. So like sometimes you write your own functions, but many times like people, if you do a file open, you didn't implement the file open that goes and like, you know, goes to the VFS layer and the VFS layer driver that then talks to XFS and blah, blah. You relied on somebody else to do all that and all the role-based access controls that are in play there to do all that. That's all handled by the kernel for you so that you don't have to do that stuff. That's all a system call is. So now let's talk about how like Linux processes are created. So the two most common uh, functions or system calls that you would use are fork and exec. And so like if you've ever done a system command in Python or Perl or Ruby or whatever, like you're essentially doing an exec or a fork there. You're basically firing off another sub process that goes and does some work, which I've done nasty stuff like that in Python where I call out to bash and I do all kinds of nasty stuff in bash because I'm lazy. And then it comes back and then I get the re you know results. Um, essentially fork and exec are the two main ones. And so in this example, I show the user shell. You know, you type a command into bash. Bash forks or execs, typically execs. Um, and then, and like, so if you run a top command, you know, or a ps, like it execs into ps and then returns. And so, like, you, you, everybody kind of understands that's how you run a process in, in bash, basically. And in that scenario, you know, you turn on some pieces of technology, right? You have access to the TCP stack. Uh, you have access to the VFS layer, XFS. You can, like, write files. You can read from files, you know, in bash. You kind of understand understand all that, right? Like, um, so that's a regular process. And then here's what, what I would argue is the magical place where it becomes kind of a container, or the piece that one of the foundational technologies that really allowed the Docker thing to happen, essentially, is the clone syscall. So there's another system call called clone, and it's a special version of fork. And in that clone syscall, you pass it a bunch of other flags, which honestly most people are not used to doing. But each, each of the, you essentially pass it what we, everyone's probably heard of namespaces. So namespaces are like uh, the host name 
name, the 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 net you know the net namespace, the uh, process ID namespace. There's all these sort of virtualized data structures that can get created when you fire off this sub process. And essentially, what you're doing is carving off, just like virtualization, carving off like a sort of little piece of the kernel, you know, a copy or a, or a reference to these you know the actual global namespaces. Like so, if you think about the process ID, you can create a separate process ID table that's virtualized, but it still points back to the global process ID table. And so, like process ID one in the container might be process ID 527 outside the container. And so even when these things are virtualized, there's still a real representation of them in the kernel. Hopefully, does that make sense to everyone? All right. So then here's what it looks like, right? So when you do a, you know, with a, with a regular exec VE syscall, you know, you, you, a process ID gets added to the global, you know, namespace. Um, it uses whatever UIDs and GIDs are in Etsy password. Um, you know, the net will be the same as the host. So we're all, we're all used to running like Apache on a host, right? And it uses the global, you know, namespace for all this stuff. So essentially like, you know, it's just normal. That's running a process in a normal way. Then if you run it in a namespace, so like I, do this here if you instead of catting Etsy hosts up there you do it inside of a docker container you're going to do it in a virtualized place right so the process IDs are going to be virtualized the UID GID can be pro, you know can be virtualized the net can be pro, you know virtualized although it doesn't have to be um, each of these is optional because these are optional things that get passed to the clone syscall um, and so this is kind of the first step where you go okay now I kind of get to understand what a container is this is the first step in the definition of like what a container is and then I think it's useful to take a look at this because this is two different containerized processes running in two different namespaces. But I think it's important to notice that when you do something like the mount namespace, um, it's still relying on these drivers in the kernel. So like the virtual file system layer, XFS driver, the block you know driver that like reaches out to say an iSCSI volume or to a, a fiber channel volume or something like that. There, those are not virtualized, right? Those are shared code. So like as soon as as soon as you can do a file open inside the container, it's still relying on all those underlying subsystems in the kernel to go do with the standard work it does. And those are not namespaced. And so, so it's important to understand it's not virtualization, right? Within, within full virtualization, you have a separate running kernel in each virtual machine, and they have their own copies of you know, all of that stuff. So they are fully virtualized. All of that stuff up there would be different between VMs, but it's shared within a con with containers. So hopefully that kind of gives you some aha moment. I see people shaking their heads, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> So, all right, so that's, that's step one is a clone syscall, right? And so I, I kind of start there at the kernel and kind of build up. So now I'm going to kind of go up a layer and talk about container runtime. So uh, I, again, I, I won't dig deep, but the but the Open Containers Initiative defines what a container runtime is, and it's an open standard. And then there is a reference reference implementation called Run C, which is the most common uh, container runtime. Docker uses it, Cryo uses it, Podman uses it, Builder uses it, everything. Most of the things on the planet that are written use it because it's a very extensible. And, and well, you know, it's supported community driven open source project that's kind of managed by the uh, CNCF. So, or actually by the by the Open Containers Initiative, which is part of the Linux Foundation. I shouldn't say CNCF. Uh, but but long story short, it's it's a community driven project that everybody uses. Now, other people implement their own container runtimes, which we'll dig into a little bit towards the end if I have enough time. But there are other compatible OCI runtimes that are like CATA containers or GVisor or other things. Um, but in a nutshell, what a container runtime does is it expects a file system mounted in a directory and it expects a so it expects like a root fs so it, if you were to cd into that directory it should have slash etsy and slash user and all the things that you'd see if you ssh it into a server and then it expects a a config.json i still have this wrong in here it's not manifest.json i fixed this in another drawing i forgot it in this one um it's actually called config.json um and essentially it's a json file that looks if you were to tease apart that config JSON, it looks very similar to the command line options that you would pass to Docker. So it's got like a CMD and an entry point and a whole bunch of stuff. But things that you might not see, like set comp rules and uh, uh, you know SE Linux things and things like that. So like there is there is like a lot of things that come default in the container engine that get stuffed into that config.json and then they get passed on to run C. 
which we'll dig into in a little while. But now you notice in this side, now in this, in this drawing, I show you, look, namespaces have been turned on because that was with the clone syscall, right? But now we're turning on things like SE Linux, C group, set comp capabilities. Um, and so now we're starting to see more of the kernel technologies get turned on by this runtime, right? And what we're doing is we're standardizing the way that we talk to the kernel to turn on these technologies. So now we're, we're really starting to see the, the formation of like a, a definition of what a user's, you know, container is in user space. And so run C helps us do that based on that OCI standard. And so that entire set of config options that you can pass into that config.json is pretty much the definition of what a container is. And that is, when we say the words containers colloquially, we're essentially referring to that in a nutshell. So then it looks like this, right? So it's more than just uh, the clone syscall, which I show here in the gray box. That's kind of the clone syscall. But then we turn on C groups, SE Linux, SVIRT, SecComp, all these other technologies get on, you know, get turned on. And then we start to say, okay, that's really a container. That's kind of what I think of as a container when I think of a container is that bottom thing, right? The normal exec VE that I showed you earlier, you know, all the, none of the things are contained in this one. The syscall gets contained, you know, essentially by these namespaces. And then we also turn on C groups to limit, uh, you know, resource constraints, so CPU, uh, memory constraints, things like that. So think of those as resource constraints. So that's to prevent noisy neighbor problems. Um, and then set comp, as for, I would call these more discrete controls that are mandatory in, in nature. So like set comp is, think of it as like a firewall for syscalls. So you can block certain syscalls or you can whitelist other syscalls. Um, and then SVIRT um, is a way to dynamically generate SE Linux labels, which I have a whole thing that I go deep into that. But, but think of it as as preventing data structures within the kernel from talking to each other. So, you know, you can say this process can access these files and this socket, and that's it. And, like, so it's a way of discreetly limiting dynamically. You know, each container gets its own dynamically generated label, and they can only talk to other data structures with that same label. So now you're starting to see a lot more powerful isolation form in this definition of a container beyond just the clone syscall. And then, you know, this wasn't the beginning of this, though. Like, if you look at, like, the Docker definition for a container, that wasn't the beginning, right? There was other things. There was libvert, there's LXC, there's, N, you know, systemd nspawn, libcontainer. All of these have their own definitions and their own user space, like, command line options or, or library-based, you know, function-based options that you can pass to them to turn on containers that basically determine which pieces of technology get turned on. So all of these have their unique definitions. And now they've all kind of standardized on some of these similar things. You'll see, like... Uh, you'll see like SE Linux and C groups and you know set comp and all these things are pretty common technologies that each of these define but the permutation of which ones you use is not you know is not standard essentially does that make sense to everyone all right, so now we build up to the container engine level. Um, this is where the meat of it is, right? So this is where, what does this do? Um, well, the container engine itself provides an API in a nutshell, and then it's able to go pull container images, and then it prepares um, you know, the configuration to pass it to the, the runtime, which I showed you. I told you the runtime expects a directory with you know, the full file system in it and a config.json. And then you basically call run C with those two things, it will go fire off a container in the way it should. Um, but the container engine is responsible for pulling that container image down, decomposing it, pulling pieces, parts out of it, which I'll dig into deeper, um, you know, creating that root FS, then handing it off to, to run C. Does that make sense? Every container engine has to do that, whether it's Podman, Cryo, Docker, it doesn't matter, even build it because it has to basically fire up a container to then add stuff to it. Um, any, anything that builds or runs containers basically has to do this piece. So, okay, so now what, is, what does this look like in action first? So, like, providing an IP, API, right? So, in the Docker world, it means the Docker D. So, if you think about Docker D, it's really what's providing the API. So, um, you know, if you, if you connect to the Docker socket and you pass it, you know, API-driven, not using the CLI, not using Docker CLI, but actually connecting to it with, say, Python or something, and then programmatically, you know, interacting with it, you're essentially using that API. Now, the command line also talks to that socket to go talk to that API. Um, there's something called a, sh uh, uh, a CRI shim that also talks to that API that works inside of Kubernetes. So if you kind of look at the most common way that Kubernetes is set up today, the kubelet talks to this Docker shim using this protocol called CRI. Then that Docker shim talks to the Docker D API. So you're translating between CRI and then the Docker API. Then the Docker API, you know, the Docker API daemon Docker D is talking to container D, which is then firing off copies of run C, which 
which, you know, passing it that config.json and those directories to then go fire off containers. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to show here, like what a system looks like in real life um, fired up. You know, this would be a containerized node, you know, a container node inside of your Kubernetes or OpenShift environment. So then the next thing that it's supposed to do, I mentioned it's supposed to provide an API, pull images, and then you know, prepare those to hand off to Run-C. Um, pulling and caching the images is often uses uh, you know, root level permissions things. So, so if you think about file system operations, um, you know, like mapping to, to overlay layers or mapping to device mapper layers, people don't realize that when that container image gets pulled down, it typically gets mapped right into the file system. So it's, again, one of the world's best proof of concepts, like all this stuff was hidden from you, you didn't realize it, but it was actually doing all kinds of funky stuff under the covers. It's actually doing like root level operations to go map these container images into the file system, caching them locally, and then preparing them so that they're ready to run later, essentially. And so that was happening when you do a Docker pull, and most people don't realize that. Um, they think it's just like a file you pull, it's living in the file system, but it's not that simple. Um, and that actually, that hung me up a while back. Like I didn't realize, you know, like that that was happening. And so here I show, look, graph drivers getting turned on. Um, you know, so, you know, X, uh, overlay is getting turned on. Um, so you're seeing, you're seeing that like this file system caching layer operation is actually using things in the kernel to actually, you know, decompose and map those container image layers to file system layers. And then, you know, then preparing the storage for runtime. So this is kind of the second phase of that, right? Once we've once we've cached the container image locally and it's mapped to these file system layers, be them device mapper or overlay two, this thing called a graph driver is what does that. But then we also have to prepare for in this, you know, in this example on the left, I show MySQL because it's something that everybody should understand. Um, if you run a container in read-only mode, that cow layer that I show there will not be there. But if you don't run it in read-only mode, which most people don't run it in read-only mode, that cow layer will be there. And that cow layer is what handles if you say echo, you know, hello world into slash Etsy hello. Like, it, it doesn't fail in a container, right? Like, all of you have gotten into Docker and played around and interacted with it in a shell. You can write files. It seems normal. But really what's happening is you're writing stuff into that cow layer. And when you Docker kill, you know, and you're, you're basically, that cow layer just sits there on disk. And then when you do a Docker RM, it deletes that cow layer. But then if you do a Docker commit, it commits that cow layer as another layer to that image layer and then maps it into the file system and then you can then, becomes part of the container image if you want, and then you can ship it back off. But a lot of people don't realize that's happening. Um, and I've had, for example, questions where people were, I have, a, I have an anecdote that I love to talk about with this one, where uh, a guy came up to me at a conference and said, well, we're building Yocto Linux in a Docker container and it's super slow. And he's like, why? And I'm like, are you bind mounting the data you know, through to like a layer and they're like no we're just building it in the container and I'm like well if you're compiling a Linux distribution which has everyone here compiled a kernel or at least how many people compile kernels anymore raise your hand if you've done it all right so enough people have done it that you understand there's a ton of file system operations right when you compile a Linux kernel and there's all kinds of you know uh, metadata changes and things like that like I mean so it's a slow operation when you're building a Linux distro so they were doing it in the cow layer. so like every single one of those file system operations was was basically writing new data and doing it in a cow layer. So of course it was slow. So I'm like, well, do it in a VFS layer. You could do it on iSCSI and it'll be faster than doing it in this cow layer, even though it's a local disk. And so long story short, they did and it was faster. But, but if you don't understand that this is happening because it's, again, a black box, you won't know what to do. You'll, you'll just do it wrong because you're like, oh, it just, I don't know, magically hap you know, handles it for you. But it doesn't know. Until you, until you pass a volume into a container engine to tell it, hey, bind mount this thing externally. Like, put var live MySQL on an external thing. Put slash var or Yocto or wherever the heck it builds. I don't even know where it builds, you know, where it builds at. But if put the build root for that kernel and for that entire Linux distro because it's actually beyond, um, it's beyond just building a kernel. It's building a whole distro. So it's laying out the file system, setting all the permissions, doing all the things that a file system, if you've ever done Gentoo, you kind of get a feel for this. But, uh, um, you know, building a Linux distro is doing a lot of things. And you don't want to do that in a cow layer because it's going to be super slow. All right, so now that I've ranted about that, hopefully all of you will use bind mounts from now on. And then just run, you know, the other thing I say is just run it in dash dash read only, then you can never have this problem. If it fails, you'll know that you need a, you need, you'll know that you need a bind mount. All right, so now digging deep into, um, you know, essentially uh, the, the container engine quickly. So, 
if you think about what a container engine does, it takes CLI options from a user, often through that API. Um, it combines those with defaults that are set up in that container image, and then it adds them to uh, you know defaults that are in the container engine. And then it creates that config.json, which I mentioned. It creates a rootfs from all of the layers in the container image, plus a cow layer. So you know it adds a cow layer, um, and then it and then it basically fires up that container. And so if you think about the directory that gets passed to run C, it's got a cow layer on top so that you can write stuff into it so it seems writable even though it's not. Um, and then it's got a conglomeration of all the user, you know, I, I'd say defaults that come in the image, overridden, you know, and then defaults in the container engine, and then finally overridden by user options. So, right, you can tell it there. So the default, for example, if you run a container in Docker, you know, it's not dash dash privileged, but it's not dash dash read only either. So if you, as a user, you tell it, you know, dash dash privileged and dash dash read only, which I think you can do. I've never tried that, actually. It would override a whole ton of things that are in the container image and in the container engine. It would disable SE Linux. It would disable net namespace. It would disable all these things. And, and so, like, you essentially think about the user has a lot of control over a lot of these different options of how that config.json is going to get built and then ran. Does that make sense to everyone? Because this is the money. <laughs> All right, and then I make it more complex. So I had I realized that as I was explaining this to people, I had left out actually CNI, and CNI does a similar thing for network, right? So there's a CNI config blob that gets generated that's actually quite similar. So if you think about what network you connect to or what ports you map, things like that, there are some defaults that come in the container image. There's some that come default in the container engine, and then there are some that are overridden by the user. And so if you think about networks, really very similar, except that we pass it off to CNI to go do that. And then there are these binaries called CNI plugins. And those CNI plugins expect environment variables and a config you know, blob to be passed to them. And then they know how to go configure, again, in the Linux kernel, these, these CNI plugins talk to the Linux kernel to configure the network in that network namespace. Does that make sense to everybody? It's a separate program that does it. Run C doesn't do that piece of it. That's where the CNI plugins come in. And so there's really a couple different binaries are working together to create a container. So does that make, because this one's a pretty much the full money. <laughs> All right. So, and then as a kind of a, so, a final, you know, I kind of, I, I mentioned, oh, and then in this one, I, I, I show that that's kind of a separate thing, but like I did, uh, oops. So I, I wanted to show in this last one, see how I turned on IP tables, the final frontier. I do a demo here where I show like in Kubernetes, if you scale a pod, you know, from like one, or if you scale a, a you know, from one pod to like 10 pods, you'll see it go from 13 IP tables rules to like 40. And then if you scale it up to 100, it'll be like 400. And then if you scale it back down to one, it goes back down to 13. And you're like, that is a ton of beating on the Linux kernel. Like adding and removing IP tables. And then also, if you've ever had some real world experience with this, if you run a production node for a while, you will see nasty stuff happen to like the IP tables config because it just gets all kinds, it gets beat on really bad. And so this is kind of my final argument for like, you should really treat the entire host as the, the node in, a, in an orchestrated environment because they're all, you know, even the kubelet beats on directly for the service layer. Is everyone familiar with the service layer in Kubernetes? So like the service layer is essentially a a way to give a name to a, a pod, you know, essentially it, it does net pod. And the way it does that is it adds IP tables rules locally. So it feels like magic when you just access the name. You're like, oh, this is cool. It just works. You don't know whether it's doing DNS or what it's doing, but it's actually doing a ton of IP tables, you know, redirects essentially um, magic and IP tables to make like, so if you have 10 pods, you can just access that all 10 pods by one name and they get round robined or balanced however, but it looks like magic to you. Well, the way it's doing that is it's going and beating on IP tables to go add a bunch of rules quickly. And then when you scale down, it's beating on IP tables again to delete all those rules. And so people don't realize that. And so that's why I emphasize that really the kernel is, is, is a, um, you know, a really important piece of thinking when you think about the container host. All right. I don't know that I have time to do justice to the bonus information because we are at 31 minutes, but um, I think I may break for questions and then hold on this and let people approach me if they want to know. But I will say, these are the three things I was going to go into in bonus because I think, and I, I want to at least 
break out my joke. Um, Kubert is not really one of these things, but I know that your brain wants to know it, so that's why I added it. Um, but, but in a nutshell, I kind of dig into each of these and kind of show what they are, too. But there's no way I can do that in three minutes because these are even more complex. Um, but with that, I will break for questions. So any questions on all this? I know that was a lot. I think it was a lot. Was it a lot? <laughs> Boom, we have a question. Does, does the, um, does the, the spec, I don't know which spec it's called, like the container spec that Lindsay implements, does it specify like the form, binary format of files? Good question. I will repeat it. So his question is, is does the spec that defines run C define the binary format of the containers themselves? The answer is no. There are, and I'll dig into it deeper in the talk tomorrow, which I encourage you to come to, but there are three specs. There's a runtime spec, a distribution spec, and an image spec. And they're all part of OCI. And the image spec defines the binary format, which is not magical. It's just a bunch of tarballs. It's a manifest.json, which I screwed up in that drawing. The manifest actually points to the tarballs, uh, which ones for different architectures, and then and then there's a list of tarballs, essentially, that are on disk, you know, in a registry server, for example. Uh, I mean, like, the executive, the executive. Okay, I don't quite understand the question. Like, if it's a command that says, like, if, uh, like if it has, like, a, if the command from the manifest is, like, if the format of that, like, being Linux, is that part of this, like, a PLF? So you're saying like like so like I guess I'll I'll answer it this way. If you like are running a Linux container on Linux, all of those binaries are ELF binaries, right. and they are not defined by the OCI runtime. No, that's defined by Linux. So like so like if you're running Red Hat Enterprise Linux, they compile their binaries and we compile our binaries in a certain way. Um, you know, and those days are typically dynamically linked, for example. And that is actually something I go into deeply in my Linux container internal stock because most people don't get that. So when you fire up a container, if ld.so is the first thing that's linked against, it will go find all the other libraries on disk, load those dynamically into the memory space, and then fire up that inside of that container, right? Like all normal process rules apply. And that's beyond the spec of run C. Run C is just defining, here's the different command line options, essentially, that can be taken from a, com you know, from a command line in a container engine. Here's the summation of what technologies get turned on in the kernel to limit those, you know, to limit that binary basically being ran. But no, you're left on your own. So like Windows containers have to run on Windows. Uh, Linux containers, I generally just say have to run on Linux. But there is obviously a, a, a syscall layer that's written in Windows that theoretically can run some Linux containers. I would argue, though, run the distribution. Like, if you have an Ubuntu server, run Ubuntu containers. If you have a RHEL server, run RHEL containers. If you have Windows, run Windows and schedule them as such. If you start breaking rules and boundaries, I guarantee there will be pain there. Like, my old sysadmin gene twitches, and I just start getting PTSD from when I would get paged at 2 in the morning because somebody's running a, you know, compiled CentOS container on Windows, and some weird syscall wasn't implemented, and it breaks in some weird way. It's a Turing complete problem, so I argue just don't do it. <laughs> All right, we're at time, so. Can we thank our speaker?